Great. Okay. So uh, I'm going to open this session. And um, well, I say that my name is Jonathan Latham. I am uh, the editor of a website uh, called Independent Science News. And we do analysis of the food system and of agriculture that for, in a, from a public interest perspective. And uh, so this is an example of the kind of things that we write. So it is, uh, this is based on a scientific paper that we published a couple of months ago, basically, uh, that uh, biotech companies have taken uh, natural BT toxins and put them into GMOs and made them basically more toxic, right? That's what we believe from the scientific literature. So, so the, and in a patent, in fact, Monsanto called it, uh, it's new, uh, the, the, new, the BT toxin that they put into these transgenic plants as super toxin. And, but that's not what they tell the regulators, right? So, so this is the kind of thing that we, uh, that we present about coming. And, uh, and so we've run this website for a while, and it's organized out of a nonprofit that I co-founded with Alison Wilson. And, uh, and this, this uh, is the Bioscience Resource Project. And we have a resource, probably of most interesting years, a resource pages that we have. For example, there's one about sewage sludge. So a lot of the scientific information, interesting scientific information about sewage sludge, we collect it together in a page so that uh, it's, it can be a kind of a one-stop shop for this sort of information. And, of course, sewage sludge is presumably relevant to this conference, right? Because if you're putting, putting nasty substances on the, on the soil and you're hoping to take up substances from the soil uh, in order to provide nutrition, you need to think about whether there's been sewage sludge on that soil first. So now this is the presentation I want to give today. So I called it a, um, a workshop because I want to encourage people, uh, you know, within reason to, to, um, to ask for clarifications and just to make it a little bit more informal. So I haven't given this presentation before. So if there's rough edges or whatever, then hopefully you'll put them down to that. <clears throat> And essentially what I want to do is look at the question of how, as biologists and as a society, we answer the question, what is life? And to look at that in such a way that uh, it elucidates the relationships between science and power in our society. Right? So, so the, you know, what I want to propose to you is that at the end of the day, uh, in the Middle Ages, we had this relationship between the church and the state, which was based on the church generating dogma that was essentially for the benefit of the, the ruling monarch and the nobility and so on and so forth. And in this way, the church supported the state and the church educated the population around these issues. And then the state was basically bolstered by that educational uh, process. And then the monarch was the beneficiary of this, right? So basically the church is involved in altering the power relations between the people and the leader. And that my thesis today will be that science is basically based around educating people around DNA, has uh, essentially reproduced that role, right, from the Middle Ages. And so the implications of this go into all kinds of interesting things. Um, you know, the future of democracy, the the likelihood of people putting up with leaders that they, that they think are fools or whatever. But also, so, so it will illuminate, you know, power relations in our society, but it will also uh, be of use in your day-to-day -day life, right? And understanding your own body, right? You're a biological organism. You need to understand your own body. If you have a wrong-headed understanding of how your body works, that is a problem. And, uh, and so... <clears throat> So, but it will also help your relations with your family or with your crops or so on and so forth. So I hope. So, so, um, so that's the, the kind of preamble. Now, this is the standard perception of DNA. So DNA is a program or is a blueprint or it's a master molecule or some kind of biological controller of <coughs> organisms, right? It's some kind of a puppet master. And... You know, because we believe this story about DNA, then, you know, we have a huge, uh, um, you know, we s spend all this money on the Human Genome Project, and the, you know, standard understanding is that we've identified 
to all these genetic con contributors to disease and to personality traits. And what uh, lies before us are huge opportunities or dangers, depending on your point of view, from, from advances in biology, in medicine, and in agriculture, and gene-edited babies, and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and so you end up with people writing books, like this one from Jeremy Whitcomb, uh, with the subtitle, Harnessing the Gene and Remaking the World. Right? And he, posited, he was one of the first people to talk about the biotech century that was going to, to, to lie before us. So this is the iconography of DNA, right? If you troll the internet, these are the kinds of pictures that you come up with for how we think about DNA. So, for example, we, show, we have picked, there are pictures, you know, people have a hard time not putting some kind of mystical background to the molecules, right? And this is not, you know, what's going on in the cell, although it could be, but, you know, this light doesn't belong in the cell, for example. And then people identify with their DNA, and then there are people, uh, you know, this is for an advert for a school system. Innovation is in our DNA, right? If, it, if innovation is in your DNA, it's in the, you know, the most important place that there is, right? <clears throat> and this is a financial services company, right? Integrity is in their DNA. These are jewelers from Antwerp, right? Cutting stones is in their DNA. And then this is search engine optimization in their DNA too. And, and then there are postulations of all kinds of implausible genetic, uh, um, genetic determinants existing in the population, right? You can postulate any kind of genetic uh, property and it will be, you know, has a reasonable chance of being accepted among the population as being, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> and so, so, and then this is the more biological trope, right? DNA is like, the rest is just translation. If you've had an undergraduate degree in biology, you'll know what this is talking about, making proteins in cells. And one of my, the really important points about this is that this, this kind of mythologizing of DNA, this story about DNA, let's call it for the moment, does not just come from uh, kooky people on the internet who don't, don't have a, uh, an education. This person here, Francis Collins, who wrote this, these two books, he is the head of the National Institutes of Health. Right? He is also the discoverer of the BRAC1 gene, the cancer predisposing gene. And uh, he was one of the founders, the leading figures of the Human Genome Project. So he's writing these mystical books about the language of God and the language of life. And you know, he's arguing that, that he has evidence for belief you know, whereas most people would argue that, that millions of people going to church every week would be sufficient evidence of belief. He had some kind of novel angle on this. Right? <clears throat> so, now I'm going to go into my, a little bit of my personal story here. So in 2005, I was at a workshop uh, at Cambridge University in England, and the host was uh, Martin Bobra. He's a well-known uh, human geneticist. And he made a comment to us, which I thought was really interesting. He called twin studies a poisonous concept. Now, twin studies, you may not know what twin studies are, but twin studies are essentially the scientific experiment that underpinned the human genome project. So what a twin study is basically... Uh, the idea that you can study identical and non-identical twins, and the, if it's true, right? So identical twins share 100% of their DNA, give or take, and non-identical tw twins share 50% of their DNA. If an illness or a predisposition or a human biological property is based on, uh, has a genetic component that, that contributes to it, if, that, if, if such a thing exists, you should be able to show that the genetically identical twins are more likely to share that disease or illness or predisposition. Right? That's the fundamental observation. And so what researchers do is they look at Alzheimer's disease, for example, and they take twins, they take identical twins, and they compare the probability of them sharing the disease compared with non-identical twins. And then they do some math, and they come up with these figures for a for a, a number called heritability, which is an estimate of the genetic contribution of that illness 
in the human in the general human population, extrapolating basically from these twins. And the uh, and he was so he's basically arguing that this this experiment which has been done, there's thousands of published papers about twin studies, and it's been done for every, you know, for Alzheimer's disease, it's been done for uh, mental health issues, it's been done for IQ, it's been done for, for uh, you know, heart disease, it's been done for um, cancer, for diabetes, you know, any, basically any, anything that you can possibly imagine, twin studies have been done for, and as evidence that this, uh, this trait, human trait, has a genetic component. And usually these twin studies show a very high level of genetic contribution. And, uh, and so, and, and the story that he related is really interesting because basically he's a geneticist who doesn't believe in the leading methodology that his, his science is, is using. And basically what he told us was that uh, when the Human Genome Project was presented to the leaders, you know, like Margaret Thatcher and, and Bill Clinton, they were, they were asking for five billion pounds to sequence the human genome. That was at the European end. And there were two types of geneticists. There were basically geneticists who were prepared to say that there were genetic predispositions to all these common uh, diseases and so on and so forth. And then there were people like him who basically said, we can't make that argument. We have no scientific basis for making that argument. And essentially those people were sidelined. Right? Because you can't go to a politician and say, well, this is kind of a fishing expedition, really. <laughs> and, and so, so they, they, they were basically those people were sidelined. And people like Francis Collins became the leaders of the Human Genome Project. And they sold the project to Congress and to the, to the British government and so on and so forth. And the, 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 the scientific critique of twin studies... It's based, it's based in part on the idea. So this is a book uh, written by somebody I now know called J. Joseph. <clears throat> and if you want to follow up on this, it's a good place to go. So uh, the critique of twin studies is that if you... Uh, um, basically, let me start again. Uh, parents, it's widely understood that parents who have genetically identical twins will do things like dress their identical twins in the same clothes, right? They will tend to assume that those, those children tend to send those children to the same schools. They will tend to, um, to take, expect that those children will follow the same sports, and so on and so forth. And essentially, if, if enough parents are doing that, they're going to skew the results of the scientific experiment, right? Because then the causes of the similarities are not the genes, they're the environment. And so this is one critique of twin studies. The other critique of twin studies is more of a mathematical one. It's basically that twin studies assume that genetic factors are discrete, uh, genetic, uh, discrete components. Right? So if you have a, a, G, a piece of DNA that makes you 1% smarter, you see a 1% increase in IQ, that, uh, that, that contribution will be stable across different genetic backgrounds, in different situations, in, diff in different environmental situations, for example. And, you know, that's a fairly implausible assumption, uh, given what we know about biology, but it is the one that's made for the calculation. And if you look at calculations done making this assumption and done without making that assumption, the, the, um, what, what the mass tells you is that if you make that assumption, you also inflate the number of the given by the twin studies methodology, right? So both of the critiques point out that the number given by the twin studies methodology is artificially inflating the genetic contribution to these illnesses. But it's being ignored, you know, the, what I'm telling you is it's being ignored by the genetic um, <clears throat> community. So scroll forward uh, five years or so, uh, myself and my colleague, Alison Wilson, uh, we wrote this article, Are Genes for Disease and Mirage? So we, what we had observed is that researchers who were looking for these genetic predispositions in the human uh, population were failing to find them. Right? Of, of, uh, by this point, uh, something like $200 billion had been spent on sequencing pieces of people's DNA and, and looking for these genetic predispositions. Right? This is supposed to be medical research money. 
Okay, and but basically, it, what, it, what it found is, is next to nothing in terms of genetic predispositions. And so, but the money was still being spent. You know, even though even though they spent ten years doing these methods, and the method, by the way, is interesting. So it's it's also very simple. So basically. You take two populations. You identify 100,000 people who have Alzheimer's disease, and you identify a matched population of 100,000 people who don't have Alzheimer's disease, and and um, you basically ask the question: Is there a piece of DNA that's overrepresented in the population that has the Alzheimer's disease? Right, because that will be a predisposing genetic factor that that is uh, in some way causative for that illness. And what these researchers were invariably finding, what we were Pointing out is that uh, that is that invariably what was found was either so statistically significant as to be irrelevant or uh, or unreproducible, right? So it would be repeated. The experiment would be repeated by another set of researchers, and they would come up with a different set of markers implying that they were already artifacts. So we argued in this paper uh, not only that these genetic predispositions had not been found. But also that enough money had been spent, enough in, uh, research information had been collected that we were never going to find these things. And uh, this paper, actually, this is in the days of the internet when you could write something interesting and it would be picked up by the media or whatever. And and um, and it was picked up in a whole a whole uh, series of places and people made comments about it and so forth. And the um, but we also got. Fan mail from geneticists, right? Who basically said to us, "We agree with you," uh, but they didn't feel able to say anything. <clears throat> and we even won a little award from a from a peer reviewed for peer reviewed papers, even though it's not even a peer reviewed paper. And so, so, um, so essentially, what we're saying here is that this money's been wasted. Right? It's been spent on on basically nothing, following a genetic boondoggle. <clears throat> Now, by this point, you're all asking me, you know, this is not the story that I expected to hear. And uh, but I want to just talk about BRAC1, for example, because it's very illustrative of the issues in this field. Right? So BRAC1 is, a, you know, probably the best known genetic predisposition to any illness that exists. And this is Angelina Jolie's the rationalization for her decision to have a double mastectomy, which she published in the New York Times. And the problem with her rationalization is that practically none of what she actually wrote in that New York Times editorial is actually true. So, for example, most cases of breast cancer, those individuals do not have that mutation in them. Okay? It's, not, uh, it's not very important when it comes to the, the actual probability of it's, it's not something that explains the prevalence of breast cancer in our population, right? There are certain subpopulations who have this mutation, but for the most part, most populations of, of uh, people in, in North America and, and Europe don't even have this mutation. It's, very, uh, it's relatively rare. The other interesting thing that she cited was this 87% risk. Doctors estimated that I had an 87% risk of breast cancer, right? Now there was once found a family which there was a, or you know, very close to perfect correlation between family members who had the BRAC1 mutation and also had breast cancer. There are also families in which there was no correlation whatsoever, right? And she could have cited zero percent, right, with equal validity as being the correlation between BRAC1 and breast cancer. The, the third interesting thing about BRAC1 is that. It's the example that you always hear of a genetic predisposition to human illness. And the genetic... Um, <clears throat> and what's interesting about that is, why don't we hear about any others? Why can't the biologists, the geneticists cite all these other examples of things they've found? And the answer is because there aren't any. Right? So that this, I'm not saying that BRAC1 has no effect on breast cancer. I'm just saying that it's nowhere near what Angelina Jolie appears to have been led to believe. Not on a population level and not on a personal level. Either. But we see stories all the time in the in the media, right? You know, this is on the front page of the New York Times that that these studies have discovered genes that predispose the population to Alzheimer's disease. So 
But you have to always, it's really worth asking two questions of when you see these studies, because they usually have one of two flaws. In fact, they always have one of two flaws. The, either the genetic mutation that's been found is powerful, it's strong, but it only exists in a tiny fraction of the population. You know, there's an Alzheimer's gene that's been found in a family in Colombia, but there are only 10 of them, right? This is not going to explain human, uh, it's not going to explain Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the second uh, category of genes that are usually found, genetic predispositions, are genes which, where basically the, it exists in the population, but the effect of that genetic mutation is tiny. Right? It's like so statistically small that you will never, ever notice it. Even if you collected together all the mutations that, that are known for many of these diseases and you put them all together in one person, which statistically never happens, <coughs> it would only increase the probability of getting this illness by a tiny amount. But we also hear about the public health benefits of the Human Genome Project. Right? The, uh, but I want to ask you this question. Just suppose that you had a child who was identified as, uh, you know, you knew that your child was not doing well at school. They were identified as having a, predis a gene, right? This is imagination because it doesn't exist. But imagine that, that, that there was a gene that was, you, you could identify in that child that was reducing its IQ. Should you give that child more education, less education, or the same education, right? The answer is everyone should get as much education as they can manage, right? There's no grounds for changing public policy based on 99% of these genetic predispositions. And now I know somebody's going to ask me about epigenetics. So <clears throat> there's several things to be said about epigenetics. One is epigenetics is not genetics, right? Epi means above. It means uh, traditionally, what it meant was chemical, uh, chemical <coughs> molecules attached to DNA that essentially mimicked genetic uh, phenomena that could be transmitted between generations. Right? So these are methylation patterns and so on of DNA. But the idea of epigenetics is kind of mushroomed into this, into this bandwagon where the National Institutes of Health is spending... Uh, you know, more tens of uh, billions of dollars uh, essentially building up uh, projects that call themselves epigenetics, when what's really going on is that these are environmental factors, right? The relabeling environmental insults as epigenetic phenomena. And to the general public, it sounds like, oh, this is more wonderful information coming from the Human Genome Project, but really what it is is evidence of uh, of pesticide damage or stress from, from antisocial uh, uh, living conditions and so on and so forth. And the cynic in me tells me that, that actually that is the purpose of this funding, right? That it's to actually mask environmental contributors to illness. <clears throat> so, uh, this is by far from the end of the story. What, what this is, is a, uh, basically, it just raises the question. Right? Why, why does the National Institute of Health have to spend so much money to prop up a genetic thesis that has, has very little biological uh, uh, um, evidence behind it? Right? What, what motivates these people to spend all that money when they could be, you know, this is the medical research budget right? that's being spent on this, this uh, non-existent health problem. So, so and it, what that did was motivate me to look more deeply into the nature of our relationship with DNA, right? Why, why are we obsessing about this molecule? And so I, you know, the, the first place to look is just the basic biology of DNA, right? What kind of a molecule is DNA? So first, there are some, uh, you know, there are plenty of uh, data points that suggests that the master molecule thesis of DNA is not likely to be true, right? The, firstly, DNA was not present at the origin of life. There's a, basically a biological consensus that there was RNA and there were proteins and there were small biomolecules, but DNA, DNA is a latecomer to evolution. 
uh, there are cells, like red blood cells, live for six months in your body, and they have no DNA in them whatsoever. Right? There are, uh, the organisms I'm thinking of really are viruses. So there's plant viruses and plant viroids that also have no DNA. Uh, the other interesting thing about DNA is a very simple molecule. Firstly, it's just a linear uh, molecule. Secondly, it's composed of four base pairs, A, C, G, and T. And, uh, and it does not, um, and it has, has properties, it has biological properties of stability and inertness, right? So this is essentially consistent with the idea that the DNA is the kind of, uh, the kind of molecule that's sequestered away from the day-to-day -day biological activity of the cell in order to protect it from damage. Right? It's not, not going on, it's not present in all the hurly-burly of, of biochemistry that goes on uh, in most parts of the cell. So it's kind of like your safety deposit box or whatever. It's not, it's not involved in the, in the, the detailed functions of, of biology. Uh, <clears throat> so that, this is why you can have uh, high school students isolating DNA and doing you know, experiments with DNA and so on and so forth. Because if they try to do those kinds of experiments with, with other biomolecules, like RNA or with proteins, those things are very uh, unstable. Those things are very unstable, and they're likely to be, um, to be destroyed by the students. Whereas DNA can, you know, the students can, they can really mess around with it and still not really make any difference to the DNA. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting is uh, to think about when you reproduce, what you do is you pass on not only DNA, you also pass on cytoplasm, right? Cytoplasm has RNA, it has proteins, it basically has, it is an organizing system of the cell that you're also passing on to your future generations, right? The, the, um, the molecule, uh, you know, if you just pass DNA onto your offspring, there, there would be no reproduction. Uh, the last thing, uh, second last thing is, Organisms are systems, right? If, if an organi organism is a system, you don't expect there to be some kind of master molecule, puppet, you know, master molecule or puppet master, right? If you think about the systems that you know, there is, uh, you know, for example, the internet or the climate or the economy. They, they don't have a central organizing function. What they have is a, a basically a hierarchies and nested uh, things going on that, that essentially all contribute to the functions of the entire system. Right? There's no part. Think about your body. You know, is your brain in charge? Is your gut in charge? Is your liver in charge? None of them is in charge. They just interact with each other in a continuous dialogue. And there's no reason to think that cells are any different or that your organism is different at different scales. And the last point I want to make here is that you know, when geneticists do research, essentially what they do is they, they develop systems that essentially isolate all other factors away from their experimental system. So they will take a model organism and they will make it genetically inbred so there's no genetic variations. They will keep it under temperature, constant conditions of temperature and light and, and so on and so forth in order to demonstrate the genetic effect that they want to that they want to find and often they get frustrated when when they can't find that effect because the the effect is swamped out by environmental uh, factors that they didn't they didn't expect and so so what I want to argue is that those geneticists have basically created for out for biology a sort of genetic bubble right in which in which there's this huge focus on DNA and genetics which, which essentially is, requires that you do things like, you know, make the environment entirely, entirely predictable. And so, so, but they've done that for, for basically for all of biology. So this is a librarian, right? I want to propose this in a very simple, as, a, as an analogy for how biologists work. <clears throat> now, imagine that there's a spaceship, uh, on, uh, you know, looking down on the earth, trying to work out how human society works. And they notice that uh, before people 
make a chair, for example, a wooden chair, that they go to the library and they get out a book on carpentry and then they bring it home and then they make the chair and then they take the book back home. Right? Or they they um, uh, they take out before they before they go on social media, they they go to the library and they take out a book for social media, Facebook for dummies or something like that. And then they bring they bring it home and they start doing their social media thing and then they they uh, they, they take it back to the library. And so they develop this thesis that that the library books are telling them what to do. And uh, so, so the space alien scientists, they will we'll test this thesis, will remove the carpentry library books and see what happens, right? That will tell us whether the books are really telling them what to do. And so, so they do that. They remove all the carpentry books from the libraries and they find that the number of uh, chairs made goes down. Right? And you know, after several generations of human <coughs> lifetimes, no more chairs are being made. And, but, and so the, the, uh, the space alien scientist goes away and you know, considers that, that his or her thesis has been proved. Right? Because, because they've shown that, that this, these books are absolutely required for making chairs, as far as they're concerned. And, but we know that there are thousands of reasons why people make chairs. Right? Sometimes it's because chairs become fashionable. Sometimes it's because the health and safety tells you you don't have enough chairs in your, in your office. Sometimes it's because, because you have a new member of the family and you need more dining chairs or whatever it is. So, so we know that in a complex system, there are thousands of reasons why any one thing happens. Right? But biologists have essentially made that mistake. They've looked at a very complex system and thought, if we remove this one part of it, and it doesn't work anymore. Though if we prove that this is the controlling factor that determines how, how basically everything works. So this is an example of that thesis, right? This is the famous central dogma of uh, Francis Crick. So the way that I was taught this in, in uh, college and high school is that DNA makes RNA makes protein. Now, it's not actually true that DNA makes RNA makes protein. DNA is a template for RNA, and RNA is a template for proteins, right? So we were mistaught in, in school. But, uh, but what this, what this uh, diagram essentially does, and this, by the way, is the, the picture on the right. This is uh, from Francis Crick's notes. So he published this in 1957, and he, uh, this is how he postulated. He actually called it a transfer of information. Which is, uh, if, you, if you try to analyze what does it mean to be a transfer of information, it means very little, actually. But, <clears throat> but he posited this concept, right? DNA uh, leads to RNA, leads to protein. And, and he, also, he also actually asked the question, where does the DNA come from? Right? If, and the answer of where the DNA comes from is that proteins make DNA. Right? If, if the, firstly, you need proteins to replicate DNA. Right? In order to put the nucleotides together, you need proteins to be contributing to that. The second issue is that in order even for the nucleotides that DNA is made from to exist in the first place, you need the protein enzymes for them to exist. Right? So it's, it's essentially, essentially, this placing of DNA at the beginning of this linear thought process, is linear biological process rather, is completely arbitrary. Right? It doesn't, it, it's not there because, because some experiment said this is how it works. It's there because Francis Crick thought that's how it might work. And it suits a lot of people to imagine that. Okay? So, so you can, um, so, there was something else I wanted to say about this. <clears throat> but, but uh, so you, can, you perfectly well could have a series of loops here. Okay? So, ah, oh, yes. The second, the last thing I wanted to say about this is, he called it the central dogma, right? And with the presumption that this is the central activity of biological organisms. This is the most important thing. This is where it's at. But actually, he had no reason to call it central anything, right? So there's two mistakes being made here, right? One is to call it a central thing, but secondly, to have it originating with DNA. So if you want to think about biological reality, this is actually how it is. But, of course, there are many more loops involved in this. If you want to take biology seriously, 
but you need a cell, for example, for all this to happen in. And so, so uh, you need, uh, um, there's many, many things that go on that, um, <clears throat> that are needed for this, for this, even this simple, you know, this kind of more, slightly more realistic uh, description to, to, um, to apply. But what it does is putting DNA at the, at the beginning and calling, it, uh, and calling it the central dogma essentially privileges DNA as a causative factor in biology. So there are many other causative factors in biology. Right? There's, there are environmental uh, uh, contributors to, to things that happen in biology. There's chance. Right? If, you, if your nostrils, are, one nostril is bigger than the other, right? that's because some stochastic thing happened in your development that, that caused that to happen. Right? It wasn't because you have different DNA for your left and right nostril. It's just the happenstance of biology. And then there are societal contributors to, to why things happen in biology, emotions, physics, right? Biologists tend to ignore physics, but all of biology has to rely on the uh, things like osmosis, things like solubility, things like heat transfer, right? Biology has to obey the laws of physics, and these laws of physics are conditional on things like temperature and, and so on and so forth, in the sense that they're, they are, they're not static, right? So these are contributors also, these are causative contributors to things that happen in biology. And the weather, right, is a great example. You may have noticed, if you have animals that, that or plants, that the weather sometimes has an effect on their, their properties. <clears throat> so, so real biology looks more like this, right? This is a simple diagram, a simplified diagram of the basic biosynthetic pathways of a uh, an animal cell. <coughs> if I, yeah, because it's simple because, for example, it hasn't showed, these amino acids are then joined together to make proteins, and these proteins then have sugars and polysaccharides and so on and so forth put onto them, right? So this is a very, very uh, simplified version. Also, uh, plant biology lacks, uh, is full of uh, secondary metabolites, right? Animal, animal, animals basically don't do secondary metabolism, but plants do, right? All those aromatic compounds and so on and so forth are products of plant secondary metabolism. And these are not represented at all here because this is a, an animal cell. <clears throat> so, I want to take a step back, right? We've been studying biology, but the interesting thing about all this biology is that it affects our, how we think about our relations with each other. Right? If we think of ourselves as being genetically determined, that is essentially a static view of biology. Right? You, have, you are the, uh, somebody once wrote in a, in a book that I'm going to show you in a second, the egg that was I. Right? They, were, they thought they were the same person as the egg, that they were the, you know, the, the embryo that they developed as. Right? And you know, the only thing they have in common is their DNA. Right? You know, these, these things are incredibly different from each other. But it gives us this static view of biology. What it also gives us is a passive view of biology. What it also gives us is a controllable view of biology, right? That you can, that you can have, uh, that you can basically manipulate the DNA, for example, and create a proportionate uh, change in that organism. Whereas if we have a systems view, of biology, right? It's very different, right? It's dynamic, right? It's non-linear. If you make a change to that system, it won't necessarily work out in the way that you predict. And uh, this, 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 uh, this biological system has free will. What's really interesting about all this, people who talk about genetic determinism all the time, they write, also write essays about the problem of free will. Because basically, if you consider that your organism is genetically determined for its IQ and for its ethics and for its, for its philosophy and for its, for its entrepreneurial abilities and all these things, you essentially have denied free will, right? And they, you know, no one wants to deny free will. And so they have to write all of these complicated essays to get them out of the hole that they've made for themselves with their genetic determinist worldview. 
So, so, and this leads to policies, okay? In education, we label children as smart or, or not smart. In the criminal justice system, you know, we label people as criminals or not criminals, or criminals that have the key thrown away. And in nutrition, right, we devalue the, the usefulness of nutrition because we think that, that uh, organisms are genetically determined. In medical research, if we, um, you know, we're surprised when a patient goes into remission spontaneously or seemingly spontaneously. And then it also leads to agriculture as a classic example, right? The preoccupation of, of, uh, of agronomists and, and agricultural researchers, you know, especially in academia, right, of, of genetics, right? You know, Norman Uphoff, he's, he's here at this conference. I encourage you to go to his presentations, actually. So he's, I mean, imagine we're talking about his SRI rice, and he has, he can, you know, give you yield gains and, and biological productivity uh, beyond the dreams of any genetic engineer, right, simply by tweaking the system of agricultural production, right? But if you become, you know, if you go down the road where all we're going to do is change the DNA. I'm off the edge. <clears throat> if, uh, if, if all you, if all, if all the, uh, if the only option that you're going to really take seriously is changing the DNA of the, organi of the crops in the field, then you limit your possibilities in the most incredibly dramatic way. And uh, this question might have appeared spontaneously, wasn't it? But... But um, the, the, uh, the flip side, I mean, it's not a bad place to have a question mark, to be honest, but the, uh, the, the flip side of all this is that our genetic determinist view of, of people and of organisms is disempowering to the organisms themselves, right? And so it has a political content. Right? So a classic example of this is there's a, there's a pretty interesting book by two Cornell academics called Dorothy Nelkin and Susan Lindy, and it's called The DNA Mystique. And it's about uh, you know, the, the, the popular culture of DNA. But what they point out in the introduction to the second edition is that in our academic system, we are in the process of replacing... Uh, the humanities with a study of biology, right? That, that if, you know, s students don't study Western civics much anymore because biology is considered to give better answers to those questions, right? You don't need to study, uh, to understand human nature, you don't need to study Sartre or Plato or Foucault or, or Edmund Burke, right? You just need to know about DNA, Right? and biological determinism of different cells, but mainly DNA, right? And, and the students have bought into this, and the university administration has bought into this, and so you see the, you know, at my local university, Cornell, the, the humanity being basically disappearing. And, and so, and the, even the, in the philosophy department, you'll see ads, oh, we want a biological philosopher. Okay. So I'm not going to go too much into... What is the alternative system to genetic determinism in biology? Just, I have some slides at the end if people want to, to go into this. But <clears throat> the two answers are uh, complex systems and emergent properties. And I just will discuss that later just to, to um, remind myself, really, of how, um, of how we, of, you know, of, of that, that I'm not actually going to talk about it too much in this talk, but basically all the properties that we ascribe to DNA in all our experiments actually are really are emergent properties and properties of complex systems, okay? So, and I don't want, you know, I, I should pause a little bit. The, I'm not arguing. I really want people not to imagine I'm arguing that DNA does not exist, right? And I don't want people to imagine I'm not arguing that DNA cannot be causative in some situations, right? People may have the cilantro gene or whatever, which, which causes them to be able to taste cilantro as soap or not, right? Or there is, you know, there really are people who, who, uh, for whom the BRAC1 gene is probably contributing to their breast cancer, right? So, so when people say, oh, but I know this example, my so-and-so family did this or that or whatever, and, and things follow from that in a genetic way, 
This is not a denial of that, right? It's just the, the presumption that you need to put the genetic uh, causation, the element of genetic causation, into the context with all the other elements of causation, right? You have to imagine that there's 10,000 other elements of causation, right? In a complex system, things can look like they're very, very important when they're not. <clears throat> so here's an interesting question, right? Uh, you know, science is full of checks and balances and, and, um, uh, and, and you know, peer review and uh, collegiality and, and, fund, and, you know, basically it has corrective properties in theory. And so, so the interesting question is how, you know, if I'm correct, right, what we're basically saying is that, that pretty much the entire biological community has had a very misunderstood version. Uh, it's studying a very warped view of life. Right? It has come to very profoundly wrong conclusions about, about biological science. Uh, and so I want to propose to you two explanations for how this happened. So one of them is, a, in a sense, is a rhetorical um, explanation. And the other one is, has to do with money. Right? It's basically about funding. And, and uh, so, to the rhetorical one, uh, I'm indebted uh, to this book here, uh, On Beyond Living, by a professor, English professor at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Rhetorical Transformations of the Life Sciences, in which he studied how biologists have talked about uh, the gene genetic principles uh, over the course of... Um, the last uh, 60 or 70 years or so. And so some of these insights come from that book. And so essentially, uh, you know, the story starts in many ways with uh, this book here, What is Life? by Erwin Schrodinger, who is a physicist. Right? He's not a biologist, and he admits as much at the time. <clears throat> uh, and it was published in 1944. And... He essentially, you know, part of the book is, is commendable, right? It's trying to introduce the laws of physics, you know, explain to biologists the laws of physics, and maybe they need to pay attention to them. But the second part of the book is it's all about these kind of value judgments of the genetic material, right? It's calling, you know, at this time, DNA was not identified as a genetic material, right? We didn't know. And um, so, but he called these, the chromosomes that are passed between generations and between cells, the material carrier of life, and the most essential part of a living cell. And then here's a killer, the law and executive power. Right? And this book inspired generations of uh, undergraduates to study biology. Right? And the, you know, Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, he cites this book as inspiring him. Right? But this is the message of this book. And the most, I believe, the most interesting of all the messages in this book is Schrodinger is the first person called uh, DNA a code. Right? Now, code is really interesting because it implies that there are some hidden properties in that molecule that we don't, you know, we can't see. Right? That they're hidden and require a biological research program to uncover. So, so first of all, we have Schrodinger, and his, I'll use his code script as an example. In 1954, another physicist, George Gamow, invented the word translation, which I already alluded to. So translation is the process by which uh, DNA, is a, DNA is a template for RNA. RNA is a template for proteins. So this, when RNA, quote unquote, makes proteins, it, he called that process translation. Now, translation is a word that implies fidelity. Right? When you translate a text, you, you try you know, your utmost not to stray from the meaning of that text, right? because you want to be honest to the author. So, so what, that, what translation implies is that the, the properties of a protein are the workings out of the properties of the DNA that was its template in the first place. And so, so this became 
a really important concept in the history of molecular biology. Because, because essentially, you could study DNA and think that you are studying the important things in the cell, even if they, it was actually the proteins that are actually doing all the active functioning. And so I want to just talk you through uh, what that means. So, so let's talk about proteins and just in the simple forms first. DNA is a molecule with four bases, A, C, G, and T. The only real property they have is to bind to each other. Uh, but they are templates for 20 amino acids. Those 20 amino acids have all kinds of biological and physical properties. They have positive and negative charges. They have hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity. Right? So they're either water-soluble or not water-soluble. They also have size. Right? They have all these properties that DNA does not have. And the proteins that are made, that are basically built up from these linear polypeptide molecules, also have, are assembled in very many cases from multiple peptides. So this is the molecule in the cell that makes the energy currency ATP. So it's made, it's synthesized from uh, eight different gene sequences. Right? So they have collective properties that were not present. Those eight things have, eight molecules have collective properties that the DNA did not have. And we can, you know, we can talk about this a lot, but, but um, because there's a lot to say. So this is, this molecule, actually, and it is a good example of a molecule having properties that you could never imagine DNA having. This is a molecular turbine, right? If you, this is the chemchar. This molecule, this part here rotates and turns, so the chemchar basically stretches up into here and synthesizes by basically chemically crushing together ADP and AT and phosphate synthesizes ATP. And the way that it does that is this is the hydrogen, this is a proton gradient, hydrogen ion. Proton gradient, which basically the protons go into here, they rotate all the way around this, this, uh, this uh, molecule. Sorry. <clears throat> the brown part got, basically rotates. And when a, high, a proton has been all the way around, it goes off into this part. So basically, you, it's converting a high gradient into a low gradient, using that energy to generate ADP, ATP rather. So you have an incredibly complicated system, right? Which is far more than the properties of the DNA that it started with. But that's what Gamow was calling translation. And then you have biologists uh, Jacques, uh, uh, Francois Jacob, and there's two French, um, and Jacques Monod, who are two French biologists. In 1961, they come up with the term genetic regulation. But what's interesting about that term genetic regulation is that what they were studying was the phenomenon that if you add lactose to the environment of a bacterial cell, that it will start to synthesize the molecules to break down that lactose and use it as an energy source. So you're talking about environmental uh, uh, influences on the genome of that plant. But they called it genetic regulation, right? As if the power was all in the DNA, right? And, and biologists have continued to use terms, and they also came up with the word program, also the word blueprint, Later, biologists came up with words like gene expression and genetic control, right? So they developed this vocabulary in which DNA was the active principle in biology, right? In, in, in defiance of the experiments, basically, that they were doing. <clears throat> so DNA also has a political history. So... You know, if you go back to the beginning of, uh, of agriculture, when people settled down, all of a sudden they could have possessions and land. They could own those things, and they could pass them on to their children. And so you see the rise of these concepts, right, in human thought, blood, birthright, and heritage, and so forth, to which were basically 
uh, um, you know, to channel the, the, the patterns of wealth. And so those existed for a very long time. The reason for this word 1909 is because that's the coining of the word gene, right? And gene becomes this, this uh, is basically the scientific version of all these ancient concepts. And at the moment of that, the transition, right, with the publication of Charles Darwin's theory uh, of the origin of species in 1859, Basically, biology all of a sudden had opinions about inheritance and birthright and blood, right? Because Charles Darwin was an accepted authority and science was an, becoming an accepted authority with opinions about, about the hereditary material. And there's this uh, fellow, Thomas Huxley, uh, who basically midwives the, the origin of species uh, in the, amongst the British public. But Charles Darwin hardly left the ha his house. But Thomas Huxley liked to give speeches, and he wrote hundreds of articles about the theory of evolution and so on and so forth. But what's really interesting about this theory of evolution is, 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 is what's really interesting about his writings is uh, there's enough information in, in the, Charles Darwin's writing in the theory of evolution to refute these concepts of blood, birthright, and heritage, because, for example, the monarch, you know, he had, Thomas Huxley had no evidence whatsoever that the monarch had better DNA than the rest of the population, right? But that's the presumption of monarchy, right? That's why the monarch exists. And that's why the monarch passes his, his uh, powers and land and so forth on to his firstborn son, right? Because that firstborn son will also have the best genotype in the country. So... So, for example, Huxley knew that DNA was not only passed through the male line, right? This is a clear contradiction of the, of the, of the patrimony and the, the patriarchal principle of monarchy, right? But he didn't say anything about that, right? He could have refuted that, right? But imagine, this is quite a politically fraught time, right? Because, because uh, you have the rise of the wealthy industrial class, rivaling the monarch and the, the, the historical nobility, right? So they're feeling, feeling the pressure. And then you've got the working classes in their factories who also, you know, they see in the theory of evolution the idea of progress, human progress, human improvement, and they, they see also that, that um, this presents political opportunities for them. So Huxley is trying to navigate those political waters, Right? And he does so by not challenging all these patriarchal concepts of the monarchy and allowing them to be passed pretty much intact to, into theories like eugenics. Right? So eugenics was the Rockefeller Foundation pet, uh, pet, you know, they were not the only eugenicists. Anybody from the upper class pretty much was eugenicists at the, in, in the 1920s. But... <clears throat> But, but they, they basically allowed, you know, Huxley's interpretation of the theory of evolution basically allowed eugenics to flourish. And so he, um, so, so the, but the Rockefeller Foundation, the interesting thing about the Rockefeller Foundation is even though they were business people, they applied a logic to their situation. They basically said, if you, um, uh, they said, if you, you know, if you think that, that uh, all these traits, biological traits, uh, like IQ, for example, they used to obsess about IQ, was passed down through generations, then there must be some, some biological molecule at the center of all this that is responsible for that. Right? And so their research program, they basically became the biggest funder in biology. And their research program was basically to find that molecule. Right? In a reductionistic sense, right? they theorized, even without, knowing, without being biologists themselves, they totally theorized that there must be this thing that existed and that they could be the first people. Hi, Bob. Is that why they called Joseph Mengele in I don't know the facts of that, but yeah, I could, I could, you know, they were really interested in all this kind of, kind of genetic determinist uh, research on human populations. So if that, you know, I don't know what he was doing exactly. 
Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, so the Rockefeller Foundation, you know, I don't need to go too much into this, but what they did was they, they understood human nature in, in many interesting ways. And, and what they did was they knew that they couldn't just transform biology for, you know, in a, if they just gave money. But what they did was they chose specific scientists who they chose them for their smartness, but also their ability to work with other people. And they sequestrated them away in many cases to generate these kind of centers of, of uh, biological activity away from the mainstream of, of medical research as it was then, and agricultural research as it was then, because that was all holistic, right, for the most part. And they wanted their people to basically get together and, and generate these kind of theses and, and do this kind of research and, you know, become the leaders, Right? And in order to do that, they had not to be lost in these departments of medicine and, and agricultural research. So they built up Caltech, for example, as a huge research institution, whereas, whereas previously it was Throop College. And, and uh, so one of their prime assets was Linus Pauling. And uh, he's a very famous biologist, but also a physicist, again, right, by training. And he, he wrote his funders, and he asked for $5 million dollars. Uh, which is a lot of money at that time, and he said, you know, causation in biology was to be found at this scale, right? Above the scale of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, because physicists study that, and chemists study that, there's no life there, right? And then, but it must be below 10 to the minus 7, because, you know, the, the, the you know, we know what we, all we need to know about, about livers and, and, and cell types and so on and so forth, they are not the locus of life. Right? It's something inside the, the organism. And so he rationalized it all. And <clears throat> so this became, uh, this is the kind of logic that he applied to that. And this is the scale of proteins and chromosomes. And then the other big uh, thing that happened was the tobacco industry in the 19, from the 1950s. They spent uh, nearly $400 million on human genetic research. They basically invented the field of human genetic research. Before the tobacco industry, genetics was about flies and it was about, about plants and so on and so forth. And they had a very simple agenda. Right? They wanted basically to find genes predisposing to lung cancer, genes predisposing to addiction, to smoking, so that basically they could blame those instead of people. Right? And so, sorry, blame those instead of, and blame the people as opposed to their products. Right? And we know this. You don't need to hypothesize it. We know this from the actual records that are in the University of uh, California. <clears throat> so, so it was a very deliberate strategy, right, which led directly to the Human Genome Project, back to the beginning of the thing that we, we just, you know, back to the beginning of the talk. So I'm just, we're pretty much at the end. So... <clears throat> What I want to do is say that, you know, DNA is not a master molecule. It's not a program or a blueprint. It's not the secret of life, but it is a nearly inert biochemical. The presumptions of genetic agency originate in ancient notions of inheritance, blood, and birthright. Such concepts exist to maintain or restrict the distribution of wealth and property. The real nature of all organisms is to be complex and dynamic self-organizing systems, Biological science has ignored this reality and allowed itself to be driven by external agendas, and the result is a profound misunderstanding in our society of the human condition. Now, I want to, to uh, just talk about some politics for a minute. <clears throat> so we have, you know, this fellow, Edmund Burke, he basically was a thinker who, who uh, basically was responding to the, uh, the French Revolution. Right? The French Revolution is basically cutting the heads off aristocrats. And the, the British aristocracy, the landed gentry and so on and so forth, they needed someone to sort of theorize what conservatism was as a way of defending themselves against what was going on in France and the, the agitations of people all over the place. And if you look at his brand of conservatism, it basically boils down to a relatively small number of concepts. It boils down to patriarchy, 
It boils down to monarchism. And I would equate, you know, uh, uh, elitism, monarchism, and, and oligarchy are pretty, you know, pretty similar concepts in all of this. So the monarch, as I said, is the person, you know, he's the, the, chief, the chief person with the best DNA. <clears throat> you know, monarchism is the ultimate genetic determinist thesis. And nationalism, right? Nationalism follows from monarchy in that the monarch has to have a population, and the presumption of that population is that they're genetically uh, homogenous. And then racism, you know, always crops up in conservative thought. And so, so what you have is these the core concepts of conservative thought are basically genetic determinism, right? Genetic determinism is the key to conservative thought. And you can see that more uh, clearly if you think about alternatives to conservative thought. You know, things like feminism, meritocracy, democracy, egalitarianism, anarchism. These are basically denials of genetic determinism, right? And so this is the fundamental struggle of our, our society in many ways. So, but I also want to, to bring in this idea too, right? Which is that our fetishization of DNA looks an awful lot like the God concept, the, monarch, monarch, the monotheistic God concept of the, the you know, that's arisen uh, with most of the great empires, right? So this is, this is a picture here of a monarchistic god that you're probably not very familiar with. This is uh, Ahura Mazda. He's the monotheistic god of the Zoroastrians. And he, basically, you know, the, the monotheistic gods are Jehovah and, and, uh, and, and the Christian god. And then there is uh, there's Allah. And then there is Ahura, Ahura Mazda. Right? And these monarchistic gods, they're all men. Right? There's an interesting observation about them. They also they're basically super superhuman entities, right? In which you know the, the dogma of the church basically posits them to have various properties. And the idea of being of being superhuman is that you can't question these properties, right? You don't you don't you know an ordinary person has no possibility of questioning them. They're above above questioning, right? And the same is true of DNA. Right? You can't, as an ordinary person, question what scientists say to you about DNA. Because you, you know, you're consider, even, if, even if you do consider that you have the knowledge to refute what they're saying, as soon as you try to say that out in public, you'll be told that you're not qualified. Right? And it's the same as the, the uh, and then the autocratic nature of all these gods. Right? So, so you have, uh, this is Ahura Mazda. Right? He's conferring the insignia of kingship on Ardashir the first, who's a Sasanian, this is about 280, the, the Sasanian king, right? So he's conferring what, what we would call the divine right of kings on his, on his chosen leader, right? So this is the purpose of these gods, right? They're social constructs designed to validate the, the, uh, the, the political preferences of the, the elite in that society. So, and this is essentially what I'm saying here. And but at the same time, they delegitimize, de uh, you know, values like cooperativeness, right, and egalitarianism, right? If we developed a theory, you know, what we're saying is if we develop a theory of biology that's based on synergisms and cooperativeness and, and, uh, and, co and, and uh, all those, those kinds of values, Right? What does that say about our leadership in the late 21st century? Right? They're basically out of step with biology. Right? That's, not, that's, not, uh, that's not a viable thing in, in the long term. And so the purpose of these gods, of course, was to, was to generate these concepts. So you have, this is, this is the, I don't know if in England, we, we, uh, we have the Lord's Prayer. Do, do, do people use the Lord's Prayer? But basically, this is, this is what the Lord's Prayer is saying. This is the first verse. You know, you worship the Father. Uh, he's a king. Uh, and his kingdom basically is the same on earth as it is in heaven. Right? He is a dictator of the universe. And so you need to have a dictator of your kingdom down, uh, down on earth. Right? And so this is the purpose of, of DNA. So, so what that means is that that uh, um, 
you know, the the essentially, I'm just. I mean, this is just a summary, really, of what I what I wanted to say. But but what that allows is a political possibility, right? If if you if you want more power to the people, you can essentially refute genetic determinism. And in the same way that the monarchy, you know, when science came along and basically refuted the intellectual ability of the church, what happened, right? Democracy happened, right? Because the church could no longer support the monarchy. So the monarchy collapsed, and there was no political alternative except to actually consult with the people in decision-making, right? For, you know, for the first time in, in Britain, anyway, for a very long time, <clears throat> that was the first opportunity in which people actually had any power, right? And so you, could, you, could, you can envisage recapitulating that process, right? If you can, if you can uh, essentially refute the genetic deterministic uh, nature of, of, uh, of DNA. So I'm going to stop there. And, you know, if people want to ask questions, I do have slides about emergent properties. Emergent properties are really interesting. But also about, you know, also would be happy to talk about the nature of gods over the last, you know, 2,000 years, because it's a really interesting subject, right? Because you have, you, have God's, you have God's polytheistic God systems, right? In which there's basically a tolerant society. So what's really interesting about that, almost all tolerant societies, because basically every single God has their own opinion about what's right and what's wrong, or what's, what's uh, well, you know, I'll backtrack. Not necessarily about what's right and what's wrong. What's right and what's wrong is kind of an interesting concept. But, but about, they have opinions about how you should live. And those opinions, basically, you know, if you have a Greek in the Greek era or the Roman era, everybody was entitled to have their own opinion because you didn't even know who, what god they were worshipping and so on and so forth. But the monotheistic system basically allows a dogma to build up, right? It allows the church, an organized church, to basically create a story around a god that cannot be contradicted by anyone else, Right? And so, so the transition from polytheistic tolerant systems to, to monotheistic dog, dogmatic systems, that coincides with the rise of, in many cases, of great empires, right, is, a, is evidence that these are really powerful concepts, right, that enable uh, power to be transferred between, you know, usually upwards, basically, to the, the generation of a monotheistic system basically coincides with the massive increase of power of the elites. And that's how they manage to control such big empires. Right? If your elite is not that powerful, then they can only control a small empire. <clears throat> so anyway, you know, those are some suggestions of stuff we could talk about. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank So Donald, you titled this the, the "What Is Life." Mm -hmm. So, will you answer that now? Well, you know, I, I do, it's not only one thing. Well, clear, but I, I would say, that. Cut yeah, the yeah, stage. <clears throat> yeah. So, so the, you know, if you try to look at life from its origins, uh, you know, you try to study the theories that we have of the origin of life. There is no clear breakpoint. Uh, we, you know, it's not at all obvious. You know, I have some theories about how life originated, but it's hard to call them a theory of life, because a uh, theory of the origin of life, because every uh, kind of iteration and, and increase in the the uh, power of of your system, right, the the living systems that exist on the planet in the early days, is it's a relatively small increment, uh, incremental expansion over what existed previously. So, so there is no hard, if there's no hard and fast line, then it's hard to see what the definition of life really would be. Like, you know, if you wanted to, to, uh, to, to postulate such a thing, it would be, it's, it's really hard. And, and there are, you know, I would, I would say that it has to be based on systems. Right? It has to be based on the idea that, that uh, you know, you have an energy source. You know, we eat every day, right? We have an energy source that we use to, we extract energy from the, from the food that we take in. And that drives our metabolism. You know, we're not the same person in a year's time 
than we were now, right? We're, we're, the, our real properties, you know, if I meet you in a year's time and recognize you, it's because we've self-reproduced the way that we are, not because you are the same molecules and the same cells and so on and so forth that you were a year before. And so, so it is, you know, whatever life is, it's not a physical, it's not a physical existence because that changes all the time. It's a set of properties somehow. And, you know, I, I, sh I feel like I should be able to give you a better answer, but, <laughs> but, but I don't, uh, you know, uh, the answer is I haven't finished thinking about that question really, because I feel like that's, it's really a hard one. And it is, um, you know, I, I mean, you know, it's not DNA, right? I mean, Francis Crick and, and, uh, and uh, James Watson, the co-discoverers of the structure of DNA, have still, uh, you know, both written books called The Secret of Life, right? In which they think DNA is the secret of life, which is not the same thing as life itself, right? Because the secret of life could be a spark or a code or something like that. So, so you know, I hate to give you such a bad answer, but... But I don't, <clears throat> you know, I need to think about it more, basically. <clears throat> and maybe I won't ever get any further than that. But hey, yeah. Interesting question. I'm not sure if you're the right person to ask. My brother, whose computer project was to do the full neural donor network, referred me to a book called The Change of Heart by Dr. Pearson Paul. And they interviewed a organ transplant patients that had very strong feelings and thoughts of their previous organ donor. And they oftentimes it was adapted their speaking patterns, dietary taste, and actions to match those people. Hmm. And they're contending that all cells in the body and their cells and organs carry a member. And I've got, I've got a first cousin that had to suffer from cystic fibrosis for 40 years. Lung transplant, which sounds as worse and is as worse as it sounds, but uh, after the IV had hit the brain where that victim got killed in a car crash, he remembers feeling the impact and being paid, and he said he had a console around him, so might cells carry the memory? Can't have a mechanism to use it? Well, you know, the a system's view of life, right, allows for the possibility of such things, right, whereas a genetic determinist view of life. Presumably would exclude that possibility, and and so so you know at least you know it opens opens your thinking to the possibility of such things, and so at least it's consistent with it. But you know whether cells, you know I am not up with the research on cellular memory or you know a lot of these issues, and I don't know the book that you're talking about. But but at least we can think about the possibility, and there's no reason not to. I don't think. And it just offers so many more questions than it answers this whole conversation. I can see different things to talk about. One of the things that struck me when you were describing the phosphate spinning around, and the, the word that came up was magic, of course. I mean, there's like, but that's really vibration or something. And then that goes to what he was talking about memory, and really it's waves and all this other wonderful stuff. What you didn't talk a lot about of the abiotic factors that we're facing with our crop systems. And what I just want to say out loud is what I think that you're driving at is that genes have really nothing to do with our diseases and our other things that are going on. It's really all those external factors. That is what this is about. Well, that is part of the, you know, the, the, you know, the funding of the Human Genome Project, right? Where's... You know, there's, this is just gossip, but, you know, there was a meeting, there was a meeting between the tobacco industry and Margaret Thatcher a week before she gave the okay for the funding of the Human Genome Project, right? And, and you know, basically the food industry, you know, what's been documented is that all these big industries were really interested in pushing this line of research forward. So they were, you know, the gambling industry has financed research on the genetic predispositions to gambling. The, the food industry has financed uh, similar kind of research. The, um, uh, all these, you know, the chemical industry is really interested in this kind of research. 
because it's a denial of environmentalism, you know, it's a huge weapon for them against the environmental movement, right? If you can get people to think that, that their Ill illnesses, you know, essentially they, they cultivated this idea, right? In the 1980s, most people believed that if they, if they, if they were obese or they got, had Alzheimer's disease or they had uh, some illness, and it really was to do with their eating and so on and so forth. And that we, you know, the, the, these industries and the, the publicity and funding of the Human Genome Project has really turned that situation around. And that now people are just talking, you know, many, many people are just talking about their DNA. When they go and see their doctor, they're just talking about their DNA. When they, when they, what they read about in the newspapers is their DNA, right? So, so, so there is that perfectly good reason for uh, lots and lots of powerful industries to be funding genetic research, yeah. There was, there was a question. <clears throat> Did you still have a question? Oh, um. agree with all of that. You know, we, we have we have these great opportunities, you know, especially in agriculture. You know, many of us see them in agriculture. And and yeah, they're ignored by mainstream academic research and so on and so forth. And so so yes, it helps you to think about those possibilities. And you know, potentially if you know if you if somebody was to refute genetic determinism in the New York Times or whatever, then 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 it would free up millions of other people to think about it too, and they might, you know, they they really would think about their lives fundamentally differently. But there is a very, you know, there's a very kind of overarching legitimacy type thing going on. But there's also the specifics, right? The very local specifics of specific organisms, specific ecosystems, specific structures. You know, your local soil. You know, can it can it can exhibit these these uh, self-organizing properties? Presumably, there's no reason to suppose they shouldn't. So yeah, so there's there's a ton of possibilities there. Yeah. Hi. Um, this is a more of a question on uh, like the political aspect of your workshop. Um, you were very particular about the like uh, authoritarian. Um, how do you see the future of us changing that um, in regards to like being more of a cooperative system like our bodies, like the soil? How, how, how could it be done? Are you asking how could it be done to... Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have the internet, right? You know, I mean, there's a ton of, there is a ton of evidence for what I'm talking about, right? So the issue isn't really lack of evidence, but it is lack of sharing that evidence. And, you know, the stories, the stories that people tell themselves change their lives. And I think this story will resonate with people when I talk to many people about it. 
they seem to think it's exciting and interesting. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason why it shouldn't spread, you know, rapidly. But it has to be done in the right way. You know, there are some people who talk about self-organizing properties and so forth, and 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 they don't, and not always happy with the scientific way that they talk about it. And this is, you know, this is useful. Like if if uh, you know, there are loads of alternative health practitioners, for example. You know who would agree? We just nod it all the way through. Do you know what I mean? Because that's that's the biology that they work with. You know they've worked in completely different transitions, their trad traditions, and so they're used to bodies working this way. And you know all I'm doing is putting it in a scientific. You know saying, you know you can put this in a scientific way if that's what works for you. But but you should also you should also understand the the political. You know the power. You know the the power of of the dogma of science. You know is that it's shared in large part, right? It's like you have this when you have a monotheistic system, you have a, a the possibility of a total uh, hegemony of rational thought, right? Of, of acceptable thought, and so that's the situation we more or less have at the moment, and that hegemony belongs to science. And so, so you have to, in a knowing way, you know, if you want to share this information or make use of it, you have to, in a knowing way, oh, it's time to finish. Uh, you have to, in a knowing way, understand, you know, which parts are, you know, at what point am I running up into scientific uh, barriers? At which point am I running up into just, uh, you know, sharing barriers? And, and then you can, it could, this, you know, it should help people share this idea, but, but in a way, hopefully, that's acceptable to people who are brought up with, you know, undergraduate degrees in, in biology or chemistry or whatever. Yeah, Is that really a, I I'm not answering you, your question? Um, it seems that, like, you're at least the ball of learning up is the decentralization aspect of the way biology works. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on like how that uh, kind of connects with because you had, did have kind of like a political background. I mean it, it's it's I mean it's totally about distributed systems, right? Complex self-organizing systems are about the distribution of power, right? Within within that system, you know the causation. The causation is uh, is is really spread around. And so that creates a model for how people can 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 exist, you know. Because because uh, you know the way the way to think that I think about religion, at least, is that you know we all are looking for our connection with the universe, and this, you know, the 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 purpose of monotheistic uh, dogmas is basically to get in the way of your connection with the universe. So so this this. This is, you know, this essentially helps people re-establish that connection, right? Science, science is also, it's a way of finding out about the universe, right? In that sense, too, you know, if you follow my definition of a, of a religion being a way of finding out about the universe and presumably in order to connect with it better, then science is also a religion, right? Because it's a way of understanding the universe and, and get, getting information from it, interrogating it to work out how you should live your life. And so, so if you find that how you should live your life is distributed power systems and, and complex self-organization, then then you know you have a different relationship with the people in, in power. But it's you know so but you means you can share information validly over the internet. You know is yeah. what it means, right? <clears throat> yes, it definitely seems like the rise of the international Maybe yeah. about how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It can be used for good or bad, for sure. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.